Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Uh, today, so I'm very pleased to welcome David uh, Detlefs uh, to MSR. David will be giving uh, two uh, conference talks uh, wedged into one talk today, um, which is uh, so. David um, has done a lot of work in the area of garbage collection and automatic storage management. He's also done work uh, in a variety of other areas. Uh, many of you know David already from uh, his time at DexERC. Uh, so, uh, with that, I'm pleased to welcome David uh, and let him get started with his talk. Thank you very much. And I just realized that I'd been speaking with people with the microphone on. <laughs> Oops. Uh, so I'm going to talk about Garbage First, a garbage collector we've been working on for an embarrassingly long time. Uh, it's a low latency, high throughput garbage collector, or so I hope to convince you, uh, done in the Java Technology Research Group at Sun Labs Laboratories, of which I'm the PI, or was until just recently, uh, joint work with Steve, Christine, and Tony. This was originally presented at ISMM04. Um, I'm going to do this talk and slightly lengthen the conference version and another related talk and slightly shorten and hope that comes out to 55 minutes. Uh, and well, we're going to tell you what the goals of this collector are, the mechanisms we use to achieve those, some results in how well we did, and then related work and future work and all that stuff you finish up a talk with. The goals are we want a collector that scales to large heaps for programs with using large numbers of threads running on machines with large numbers of processors. And simultaneously, and this is what makes it hard, we want uh, compliance with a soft real-time goal. Soft because it's high probability compliance. Um, this is also known in the literature as a MMU, minimum mutator utilization specification. So something of the form, garbage collection shall consume no more than X milliseconds in any Y millisecond interval of, of execution. And you know, there's an infinite number of such intervals, and none of them should, ex should ex exceed the X milliseconds. And simultaneously, as a secondary goal, we want to get high throughput. And we want to do this on machines with large number of processors. So this implies if you ever stop all the mutator threads, that's garbage collection geek lingo for the non, you know, the real program. Uh, if you stop them, then you have to use parallelism to effectively uh, make use of all the processors to decrease the length of that pause. And we'll also use concurrent techniques when the mutators are running. So why do we care about this uh, MMU concept, this minimum mutator utilization? Well, we're targeting our tasks that could be described abstractly as there's uh, incoming t applications that can be described as having incoming tasks which come in some sort of queuing system, might be buffers in the network stack or an explicit queue in the application, and then are claimed by application threads and processed and retired. Well, if you stop such an application for GC, well, you're not going to be processing tasks. The length of the queue is going to grow. Um, two things. First, you better not stop. If there's, if there's an end-to-end -end application constraint, one, one we've worked with a lot is uh, when you dial the last digit of a phone number, the phone companies generally like it if within 500 milliseconds it starts to ring on the other end. Um, so if you have an end-to-end -end application constraint like that, then that induce, gives you some constraints on your GC time. Well, it better not be more than 500 milliseconds for one thing. But another one is if, you, uh, if the queue length is growing while you're stopped, you better be retiring tasks faster than they're coming in when you're running and you better space out the GCs enough so that you get back down to a zero Q length before you do another GC. So you can imagine how you could derive from the end-to-end -end application constraints one of these MMU specifications. So the mechanisms we're going to use here are heap regions and remembered sets that uh, evacuation pauses. Well, that's going to tell you a bunch of names here that, the, that we use to actually reclaim the storage. The generational, the way we incorporate the generational ideas in the, into this collector, uh, two concurrent um, processes that go on, one for maintaining these remembered sets to enable independent collection of these heap regions, and another to do concurrent marking to determine uh, global liveness. And finally, uh, heuristics we use for choosing collection sets of heap regions to evacuate that both uh, try to maximize the efficiency of the garbage collection process and also 
uh, make sure we don't violate the real-time constraint. So we lay our heap into a, a sequence of equal-sized regions, we call heap regions. The granularity here is rather large. The default size in our system is a megabyte, you know, not pages, but something rather larger. And we'd like these to be independently uh, collectible. And I meant to say at the beginning, please interrupt with questions, but I've never heard anyone say, please don't interrupt with questions, and I don't imagine I could stop you, so maybe that's redundant. Um, so each, we'd like to, each region to be independently collectible. If there's pointers from outside other regions uh, into this region, we need to be able to locate such pointers. Therefore, each region has associated with it a remembered set structure that identifies those locations outside the heap so we know where to look conservatively. Um, when we do an evacuation pause to try to reclaim some memory, we pick a, a collection set of regions based on some heuristics we'll describe, and then we uh, evacuate the live objects where liveness is as indicated by the roots, the stacks, local, global variables, etc. The remembered sets of the data of the heap regions we choose, and previous marking information. What I mean by that is, if if we've done a concurrent marking and it's shown say this object to be dead globally, then even though it's pointed, it's uh, indicated by the remembered set that it contains a pointer into uh, the region we're trying to evacuate, we don't evacuate the object, or at least we don't do it on account of this pointer. And that's the main way in which uh, marking information has impact on reclaiming memory. So we, we evacuate elsewhere in the heap to hopefully the you picked regions that weren't, didn't have too much live data, so you got some net stuff back. Um, this evacuation is done in parallel using a parallel collection algorithm based on our work uh, a few years ago, which is a fine-grained work-stealing based system. You do some static partitioning of the GC work, and then the threads dynamically race to claim the static partitions. Since the garbage collection is uh, a very dynamic task. If the tasks we're talking about are scanning of individual objects to find what else is reachable from them. So when you scan an object, you may create several subtasks of scanning other newly found reachable objects. This is well suited to the work stealing uh, method of dynamic load balancing. And the Aurora Blumoff uh, Paxton uh, lock free work stealing queue data structure is sufficiently efficient that you can do this on this fine grain and not suffer much in the way of performance penalty. Um, Endo et al. is another work stealing based concurrent marking system. Um, in our original implementation, we had a couple of different phases in a, a collection pause. One, for example, to make sure that some tail of work to get the remembered sets up to date was done, and then you could do the collection proper with a barrier synchronization in between. Well, we gradually got educated on parallel programming and learned that barrier synchronizations are bad. You should avoid them whenever you can. So Christine, uh, did, Christine Flood did uh, some pretty clever work to figure out how to uh, merge these together with a little cleanup stuff at the end to make sure everything was right. And that got significantly better parallel parallel scaling. So let's talk about remembered sets for a while. Um, one red flag that goes off with some people for a collector of this sort is, whoa, what, you know, remembered sets pointing, at, pointing out every place elsewhere in the heap where there might be a pointer into here, that could get pretty expensive, couldn't it? And the answer is yes. Um, and we'll go into that in a little bit. The remembered set here is a set of cards. A card is similar to the cards used in generational card marking write barriers. A, a, a smaller contiguous uh, equal size division of the heap, think 512 bytes. So uh, a rem member set of a region is the set of cards outside of the region that might contain pointers into it. Um, in our original implementation, we used uh, hash table based sets, and it would be rather expensive to have the inline write barrier executed by the mutator insert a card, if necessary, into a hash table. So instead, we're making the assumption that there's a fair amount of extra hardware parallelism available. So what we do instead is log the updates in such a way that a concurrent remembered set thread can read those and uh, insert the pointers as necessary, the cards as necessary into the relevant remembered sets. Um, 
this also simplifies somewhat the uh, concurrency control uh, on manipulating the remembered set data structures. We do, however, the, it's not the case that the mutator barrier is completely simple. It uh, is written to filter out for intra-region pointers, uh, rights of null, uh, rights to cards that are already dirty. So this relieves a lot of the pressure on the concurrent process and reduces its overhead a fair bit. I want to note that if you buy the argument that you can't do the whole process inline, well, neither can you wait and save up all the work to do it in a, the next collection pause because it would, in some cases at least, swamp, you know, you know, blow out your pause time budget. So, so you have to do this concurrently if, if you buy that argument. Question. Yeah. Uh, there's a single thread that At present, yes. Uh, we're trying to have complete scalability so that that, that can be multiple threads. We, we, we've achieved that for marking, but not yet for, we haven't had any reason to do it for, uh, for this problem. Actually, let me say one other thing. I, I'll take that back. What, what we really do is there's uh, a maximum number of completed log buffers you're allowed. If, if, you, if a mutator attempts to add something and it, we've reached that, then the mutator does the work itself then. Okay. But the, and you move out of order in some problem. Yes. Okay. Um, in, when I gave this version of the talk at ISNM, I had to confess to a rather embarrassing fact about our then implementation at the time. Um, for most applications, the remember set space overhead was, was fine. For one particular application that's very important in the Java uh, benchmark world, SpecJBB, it was the case that the remember set space overhead was greater than the amount of live data in the heap for a typical run. Ooh. Um, so we've worked on that a fair bit. So now what we have is that the remembered set of a region A uh, tracks pointers from each other region B differently, separately, and at two levels of precision. First, A has a course table with one bit for every other region. A set bit there means everywhere in B must be considered to possibly contain a pointer to A. Well, it's uh, very space efficient, but not very precise for doing collection. You probably can't collect A in the given pause time while that's true. Um, the, then there's the fine granular uh, coarseness where you keep track of the individual cards in B that reference A, and you do this using two representations, one sparse and one fine. Let me explain this more pictorially. Um, here we have the remembered set of A, and it has a coarse table, a sparse table, and a fine table. We notice that there are some pointers from B to A, and so we add an entry in the sparse table for B where it record that C, card C1 is, contains such a pointer. Maybe we do that again for card C2. Maybe the limit on the number of cards we uh, can record in a sparse table entry is two. We actually use six, but um, when that's uh, full, we transfer on the next insertion to the fine table, which uses a bitmap uh, representation. If you want to add a fine table entry. The number of fine table entries is capped at a constant number. If you need to evict one, you find some approximation of the most full one and move it to the course table by setting its bit. So I claim that this actually gives you a bounded amount of, a bounded fraction of storage per region um, as, as a fraction of heap size if you require the heap region size to grow as the square root of the total heap size. Uh, you do some you know, worst case space overheads and that's the way it comes out. Ba basically, be, oddly enough, because of the course table in, in asymptotic terms, right? This, that's obviously n squared in the number of regions. So if you make the, okay. Uh, so this fixes our problems. The former space problems are now less than 1% of the total heap space, which is much better. Um, any garbage collector that ignores the lessons of generational collection is doomed to, not to failure, at least to extreme inefficiency. Um, so what we have is a mutator allocation region can be declared young heuristically before allocating into it. So if I declare a region to be young, then I'm promising that it's going to be included in the next collection set. What I get for that is I don't have to process uh, pointers in that region uh, in remembered sets. 
because it'll be part of the next collection set. I'll, I'll find what's reachable from objects in live objects in that region. Um, note that the young regions are not physically segregated. You know, often you'll see uh, systems with here's the young generation contiguous area memory, here's the old generation. So the size of the young generation can vary very dynamically, which is a nice property. Um, so we choose the number of young regions to fit the pause time via dynamic feedback that I'll go into a little bit more later. Uh, I want to note that you could choose not to make a region you're about to do mutator allocation in young. Maybe you query that I can't do a pause right now because I haven't reached the 250 milliseconds in my 50 out of 250. So I have, but, I've, but I'm still doing allocation. Well, I can this time do those as non-young allocations uh, and make sure I still meet the pause time when I'm able to do it. It just imposes a little extra overhead of remembered set processing, and I have to get those via other mechanisms. Question? Yes. So what happens if you mislabel something as young? Well, that's a bug in the collector, first of all. Uh, so do I have to say more than it's a bug in the collector? So, I mean, the, so you rely on that being accurate. It's not a heuristic. We rely on if you heuristically decide to label it young, then you must uh, add it to the next collection set. That's the correctness criteria. Um, so then let's talk about concurrent marking. Um, Eventually, the objects that survive these young generation equivalents will go to the old generation. You have to collect them somehow. We do a concurrent marking uh, algorithm. We use a snapshot at the beginning mar uh, marking algorithm versus an incremental update algorithm. Um, our experience is that this results in considerably shorter pause times at the end to reach the transitive closure of the marking. Uh, there's some extra barrier overhead, and that will be the subject of the next talk. Uh, but, as I said, much shorter marking-related pause times and less total work. The, the trade-off is that um, in the incremental update algorithms, you have some possibility of collecting garbage allocated since the beginning of marking. Here you, you're committing to having no possibility. Everything is considered live, allocated after the beginning of marking. So the marking process also, also records the amount of live data in each region. And We'll talk about that in a second. I want to mention one other thing because we just talked about remember set pro uh, processing. So you imagine that the marking process gives you an uh, external bitmap where set bits corresponding to object headers indicate live objects. Well, we have two other bitmaps of smaller granularity, one at card granularity with one bit per card and one with one bit per region. We make sure that if there's any part possibility of a pointer of a live object being on a card, then that bit in that bitmap is set, similarly for regions. So if you look back at the representation of the uh, remember set, we can quickly and the uh, bitmaps for the fine grain tables and the corresponding portion of the card marking table, <laughs> bad phrase, uh, and reclaim, uh, take cards that no longer contain live objects out of the remembered sets, similarly for regions. Thus, that's the only mechanism we have for decreasing the size of remembered sets, so it's kind of important to recognize. And that can make a, a region that wasn't collectible now eligible for collection. Uh, the, as I mentioned, objects allocated during marking are allocated black. They're not, they're live with respect to the marking that's going on. We do this in, in a somewhat clever way, we think, uh, that avoids the expense of actually updating the bitmap, you know, adding that to the allocation code path. Instead, we record the value of the contiguous allocation top pointer in each region at the beginning of marking, snapshot that, and every, anything above that is implicitly live. Um, another interesting aspect of this, I don't know any other collective that does this, is that evacuation can occur during and independently of a marking cycle. Um, as I mentioned, evacuation uses the results of the last completed marking cycle in determining liveness when it evaluates remembered set entries, but it also preserves the partial results of the in-progress marking. And you know, the, the garbage collection does essentially a doesn't change the shape of the object graph, right? So we, we recognize that and make sure that the new objects are partially marked and are gray in the right way. Okay. 
So how do we use this marking data? Well, let's say we complete a marking cycle. The regions are laid, labeled with the amount of live data, uh, which implies the known garbage, obviously. First, we can reclaim any completely re uh, free regions concurrently, which often is a major source of storage reclamation. Um, now we can continue allocation, and let's say we've uh, reached a point where we want to do another garbage collection. Well, we can choose the most attractive regions to collect, right? which is actually a, a I've shown here the percentage live, and we chose the smallest percentage live. But the remembered set sizes also factor into their cost of collection. So for each region, we can uh, compute their expected GC efficiency. So we'll evac the, some combination of newly allocated young regions that we've committed to include in the next collection set, plus some attractive non-young regions, and get a hopefully efficient collection. Um, so for these non-young regions, we have a, a model that predicts the cost of adding a region to the collection set. Well, it's proportional to the, the amount of live data, the size of the remembered set, plus some per region constant. Uh, these are estimated initially and tracked dynamically. We add regions, as I mentioned, in efficiency order until we fill up the bucket of available time. And this, this allows us to pretty accurately uh, predict that we're going to meet the pause time goal. It's a little bit more difficult to model the cost of the young regions. This is something Tony and I have worked on since that last paper. So we have no marking information on survival, so we have no worst case. But we do have the possibility of uh, getting some historical data to guide our choice via dynamic feedback. So we gather historical data on survival. We, when we do a collection pause, we logically order the region by fine grain age. Zero is the most recently allocated region, one is the second most, et cetera. And then we can track the survival rates by that uh, fine grained age. So generally, you'll get some sort of histogram like this. Survival rate will generally fall off with age, because what can objects do? They can't become live after dead. They can only become dead after alive. So we maintain an average of this histogram over several collections. Then when we're considering uh, collecting n young regions, well, you can predict that the cost is, we take an average for the remembered set sizes, which is generally pretty accurate for most programs, that there's not huge differences. Uh, and then, but for the survival rate, we can pretty accurately predict that. And this, this is interesting because if the pause time goal is liberal, you can have quite large collection sets because when the survival rate falls down to near zero, as it does for many programs after a sufficiently long period, um, you can add a lot of extra regions without increasing the pause time very much. So you almost get the effect of an Appel-style collector in which you use all of the available heap um, for young generation on each collection when that's appropriate given the pause time. So a garbage first execution looks kind of like this. We'll, uh, this is the heap usage over time. We'll allocate, do a fully young collection, a fully young collection, which means only young regions, no non-young regions. We'll do a fully young collection on which we piggyback the initial uh, phase of marking from the roots. We'll do some marking, uh, a fully young collection during marking. Eventually, we'll finish marking and do cleanup where we the C there that uh, reclaims a fair amount of memory. That's not uncommon. Now we'll do some sequence of partially young marking where we have some young regions plus really attractive, the, the most attractive non-young regions. So the first of those might collect a lot of memory in the uh, allotted pause time. The second, a little less as we're getting down in the, you know, to the less attractive regions. And at some point, the efficiency of the non-young, of doing these partially young collections is less than the efficiency of going back to just doing fully young collections and we'd repeat that process. Uh, some benchmarks. Um, I've been saying for two years now that I'm going to try to get permission to uh, tell what the t actual name of the telco application is. This is a call setup application that when you dial the last digit, rings the thing on the other side. This is a little uh, cottage industry. There's several companies doing this particular thing called SIP servers as a SIP protocol that does this in Java, um, which has been a good set of applications for us. Plus spec JVB, um, 
And I'm going to compare with what I'll call par new plus concurrent mark sweep, or CMS. This is our best sun product solution for low pause time and high throughput, which are, you know, we're attempting to replace, even though we did it in the first place. Um, first, I'm going to talk about compliance with this MMU specification. So I'm going to give three somewhat unusual metrics for displaying this. First, this, the, if we consider at, let's say, one millisecond granularities each of the Y millisecond time windows, what fraction of those exceed the uh, specified maximum pause time? That's the V percent, violating percent. And then for those that do violate, by what fraction do they violate? The average amount of the excess over the pause time specification. And finally, what's the worst case violation where this is somewhat, I don't, know, I don't remember why we chose to say it this way, but it's what percent of the specified mutator time, the 200 milliseconds out of 250, do we consume with garbage collection on the assumption that 100% here is maximally bad, uh, even though it might actually be a 10 second collection, that's, that's as bad as it needs to get. Um, so we do pretty well. Uh, CMS has uh, occasional worst case violations because of uh, its in incremental update nature. Sometimes the remark pauses take excessively long, as we'll see on the next slide. And you know, we violate fairly often and by a fair bit. We're doing quite a bit better. And since this, we've done more work to um, make this really low. It's, it's now, I don't remember the numbers off the top of my head, but Tony has done a lot of work on this, and those numbers are better. Uh, I want to note that the snapshot at the beginning technique is quite good at limiting marking-related pauses. Uh, CMS in extreme circumstances, as I just said, can, uh, can have a hard time catching up to multiple mutator threads. You know, it has to look at every, it has to observe every modification done, whereas snapshot at the beginning doesn't worry about modifications done to things afterwards, uh, allocated since the beginning of collection. So, so this is a win for us. And throughput, um, we've managed to achieve approximate performance parity with the collectors we're trying to replace, and we're hoping that that's good enough. You know, this doing pretty well at garbage collection these days. You know, three percent is a typical overhead for these kind of applications, so it's hard to do much better than that. We're hoping that the other advantages of um, the CMS is a, a non-moving collector. We always have the fear that we're going to be waking up in the middle of the night by. Oh, there was fragmentation in the Spanish phone system. So, uh, so it's nice to do compaction. And so we've achieved rough performance parity is the thing to take away from this slide. And it's, it, the G3 contribution to throughput here is almost completely dominated by young gen collection costs. So those are very similar algorithms here. So that's what you would expect. Uh, there's a fair amount of related work on independent collection of heap region-like things going back to Bishop's thesis in 77. There's obvious uh, uh, comparison to the train algorithm, um, the mature object space algorithm of Hudson and Moss. The difference here is that we have independent collection of the um, of independent choice of the collection set, whereas the train algorithm commits to a particular order to collect things. Uh, on the other hand, they have unidirectional remembered sets. And we have bidirectional. I'm not sure that makes that much of a difference. Uh, then there's the MC squared work more recently at UMass, which has some, some of these, this flavor. Uh, so there's been a lot of concurrent markers. For marking and evacuation, there's been Lang and DuPont had a single-threaded system in which you could say, I'm going to evacuate this portion of the heap, but just mark that portion of the heap, which is the closest thing I've been able to find. Uh, OK. Uh, also, this has some relationship to the oldest first collector ideas where um, it's often the case that the most attractive regions you get from marking are the oldest regions. They had the longest time to die. So if that's the case for your algorithm, we'll automatically go into an oldest first mode, at least for the older generation. And it's also related to real-time GC, though the, the trade-offs we're making here is the if you compare with, say, the metronome collector or the Henriksen collector of, at the University of Lund, those use the Brooks forwarding pointer trick. Every object has an extra forwarding pointer, and you always follow that extra forwarding pointer. Usually it points to itself, but 
Otherwise, if you copied the object, it could point to the new copy. So this gives very fine-grained interruptible, fine granularity of interruptibility of garbage collection. You know, the atomic unit of, is cut processing one object. Here we're saying the our smallest atomic unit is one megabyte of, of collection. And we're, we're hoping that the throughput advantages that gives is worth the, you know, that, that there's application for which that's a good trade-off. Uh, well, I guess I can tell you a little, I have told you a little about that about more efficient young gen collection. There's some other stuff I have to keep a little secret that's working out well. I've um, been working on dynamic pre-tenuring uh, via a, a new system. I'm not going to go into that because I want to go to any questions on this before I launch into the next one. I'm a little confused. What do you, what do, you do about uh, we wait until the, con the global reachability analysis of the concurrent marking uh, finds them to be garbage. No, uh, there's various uh, alternatives you could use for deciding when to do concurrent marking. Uh, you could, you know, some heap occupancy threshold, hoping to finish just in time before you run out of heap. Or uh, if you're using this in a client system, you might. You, hey, nothing has been happening recently. Maybe it's a good time to speculatively start a concurrent collection. And in fact, you could uh, compact the heap increment. It's very small increments. So you hope to have a compact system by the time the user starts up. Okay. Well, I go to talk number two. I forgot to apologize for lack of uh, any whizzy uh, slide transition. This is open office, not PowerPoint. Oh, sorry. So this was uh, work with Krishna Nandavada of UCLA. He was an intern in summer of 2003. It took a while to finish this work afterwards. Originally presented at uh, Code Generation and Optimization in 2005. Um, here I'm going to talk about static analysis to eliminate the marking barriers associated with snapshot at the beginning concurrent marking, henceforth SATB. Um, and there's two techniques. I'll, I'll talk about why we want to eliminate these marking barriers, and then two techniques for doing so. One identifies what I'll call pre-null object rights to object fields and another pre-null rights to elements of object arrays. Um, and if there's, if time permits, we'll talk about some as yet unimplemented ideas for making these analysis, the results of this analysis better. So I guess I've hoped I've convinced you that doing concurrent marking versus stop world is a good idea, at least for some applications, and that uh, snapshot at the beginning has pause time uh, benefits versus incremental update techniques, at least in our experience. And this seems to be borne out by the number of SADB-based concurrent marking systems that uh, not just us, but IBM's metronome system worked by Eris Petronk et al. at the University of Tel Aviv. Um, but the drawback with SATB is the required write barrier is considerably more expensive. So our contribution here is, well, if you can eliminate a lot of those statically, well, then maybe the, the con goes away and the pro dominates and you know, we'll just settle on SATB being better. Mm, though, I guess some people would argue about the floating garbage issue, but we don't see that as a big deal. Uh, so, SATB concurrent marking. The idea is you want to take a logical snapshot of the object graph as of the beginning of marking. Um, objects allocated after the beginning of marking are implicitly marked live. So the barrier for an update O.F gets X is going to log the preval, the value that's overwritten by x of o.f. So before we let this o.f um, transfer to here, we're going to read the value it contains, put that pointer in a log buffer, treat the contents of this log buffer are read by the concurrent marker and treat it as a source of roots. Thus, we can't lose any part of the, the snapshot object graph. So what does the barrier code that accomplishes that look like? Uh, in our system, it looks like this. We check some global variable, actually a, uh, a field of the current thread, which is held in a, a register. And if marking isn't in progress, then we skip and go down to the store. 
If it is, then we read the, the value. Uh, if that's null, there's nothing to log, so we go to the store. Otherwise, we log it, calling an out-of-line routine. Um, not nice to have to do an extra memory operation before every store. Uh, so how much does this cost? Uh, we took spec JVB, gave it a really big heap and a shortened run so that no marking was actually necessary for correctness, and compared no snapshot at the beginning barrier generated at all versus a mode in which marking was always on. And this is extreme, but I I'm, feel it's not a bad comparison because you might, in, you, you probably in many cases want to uh, slow down the marking process, make it pause a lot to spread its work over a longer period so that it doesn't show up as extra overhead in concentrated periods to the mutators. Uh, so if you do that, the bottom line is that with this system, with the hotspot client compiler, by the way, it costs about 2.5%. With the more highly optimizing server compiler, that would go up. Unfortunately, we haven't implemented this for the server compiler yet. So what are we going to do about it? We're going to let me make a few definitions here. A, a store site is a place where you do a, a store, and for purposes of this talk, a pointer store. A pre-null execution of a store site is one that dynamically observes a pre-value of null. A store site is pre-null, we'll say, if it's provably the case that it would always observe null, and thus could be eliminated. For purposes of later measurement, I'm going to make one further concept. A store site is potentially pre-null with respect to a set of executions if in those executions you never observed a non-null value. So potentially, the set of potentially pre-null store sites is an upper bound on the number of actually pre-null store sites. Okay, so I claim these are common. Well, initializing rights to newly allocated objects are usually considered to be the most common kind of rights. Those will all be pre-null. So if we can identify those, we'll be at least in a part of the way there. So that doesn't sound too hard. It gets a little bit more complicated, though, when you consider escapedness. So if we allocate a new foo and pass it to bar, we don't know what bar did. It might have written to the X field. It, this method escapes, if you will. So we, we can't declare that right to be pre-null. Similarly, I guess, um, if F becomes globally available to other threads, they might update it, and then this isn't pre-null. Note that uh, there's a subtle point here. If you were just trying to do a read of F.X here, you would be permitted by the Java memory model to assume that it was null. There was no synchronization operation there that forced you to observe the results of some other thread's write. But in our case, to make the algorithm work correctly, we, we don't just have to explain the execution, we have to have it be correct. So, so we're not able to take advantage of that issue. Yes? So we have these cases where uh, F is the I'm sorry, imagine I put uh, open, closed, and a constructor invocation. Uh, and then, uh, okay, so, so, it's one, so, so even after the initializer, yeah. Yeah, this is complicated by the Java uh, constructor semantics. We would just follow the ones I just said. Exactly. Right. Uh, th this might be the body of an inline constructor, for example. Okay. Okay. Um, so in general, we have to prove that F has not yet escaped in order to do this optimization. I want to claim that it gets even a little bit more complicated. Consider the following little uh, variation on the previous example, which puts the relevant code in a loop and reorders it a little bit. Well, if we look at it you know, as human beings, we'd say, yeah, that's pre-null. F is new every time. Uh, it's clearly null when we do the pointer right. But traditional escape analyses aren't geared towards this problem. Generally, they only want to determine, is it the case that the thing allocated at this call site eventually escapes? And they aren't, don't usually have to be very precise about the value of uh, fields of objects. For example, many uh, escape analyses would say, there's a single abstract value representing all objects allocated at Alex site A. And 
when there's a single one for uh, the second allocation site. So we would say, as a result of this store, things allocated at A can point to this X. And when you go around the loop, you reach a fixed point in which your final state of your uh, program analysis says that Alex site A can point to X. You don't keep track of the idea that at the time of this store, it didn't point to X yet. So we have to make it more precise in that way to capture examples like this. So the techniques we use are pretty standard uh, pointer or escape analyses, uh, similar to Choi et al. or Reinhardt and Whaley. There's a big literature on this stuff. Um, it's presently only intra-procedural, though it does see the effect of the JIT compiler's inlining, so it's partially intra-procedural, inter-procedural, if you will. I think someday I'll be able to verbally distinguish between those two words. Um, so the analysis state has a bunch of local state components, the um, JVM local variables and OSTAC locations, representations of objects uh, allocated at allocation sites. Those can be labeled local or non-local. The values in the analysis of pointer containing com state components, I'll say, are set values of what pointers they might point to. Pretty standard. Uh, global ref to everything we don't know about. So to handle the allocation instructions, um, we actually have, I guess the, the term is uh, k limited for k equals 2 analysis for the allocation sites. So there's one, the a version of the refer abstract reference for the allocation site I, at bytecode index ID is, represents the unique, most recently allocated object at that site. The b version represents all previously allocated objects at that site. So Note that the A version is unique, therefore, in the analysis, it allows strong update. If I do a store to it, I can erase the previous contents of the field and uh, don't have to set union the contents as you do for weak update, which you must do for the B version, which re represents a whole potentially infinite set of objects. So when we come to execute the new instance operation, we look in the current analysis state substitute the B version for the A version everywhere because the A version had represented the most recently allocated one and no longer will. So we merge it into the, the B set, get rid of all the A's. Now we can use the A as a fresh uh, abstract reference to denote the now most recently allocated version. So we can say that its fields are null and return the singleton set of that as the result of the allocation. So we we're pretty proud of this technique, thought it was very useful, and then looked back and read the literature more closely and found out a paragraph of the Reinhardt and Whaley uh, escape analysis technique suggested it, but they didn't explore it otherwise. So let's run through how this works. So we're going to execute the new foo. We do so. We get the A version of a thing allocated at that alloc site, and we set F to point to it. Now we allocate the X. We get the A version, make the X field of the foo point to it. Now we make them escape transitively. They're non-local now. Now we come around the loop again in the analysis to try to reach a fixed point. Um, first, before when we allocate the, the foo, we make the A version into the B version. And we can now use the A version again as the new, unique, most recently allocated object. Do the same thing with x. And I claim that this last little anal uh, abstract execution of the loop body was a fixed point at each at each instruction, that if you did it again, you would go through and do the same things. So we get the nice property that uh, we get the property we're looking for, that when we did the pointer store, we knew that it was overwriting null. I think, I think this is a good uh, optimization in general, a good technique in general for uh, doing this sort of escape analysis as well, not just for this problem, because of the extra precision. OK. so. In summary, we get a very accurate model of heap contents for thread local most recently allocated objects as well, which is the ones we're really interested in. And in short, we can identify initializing rights to pointer fields with pretty high accuracy. It turns out that uh, a significant number of uh, rights to pointer fields are in arrays, you know, not statically, but because array rights often occur in loops dynamically, they're very important. So we want to handle that as well. A prototypical case is you have some, let's say, a stack with an underlying array as its implementation. And when you, the stack is full and you do a push on it, you need to double the size of the representation and copy the old elements. 
probably you would have some sort of system.array copy sort of thing. And, but let's say you wrote a loop instead. Uh, what would you want to do? Well, clearly you can you look at this and say this over, always overwrites null because this was allocated with all nulls, and uh, that's not hard to see. But really, to do that mechanically, you have to infer an invariant that at all points when for j starting at i up to the array length new array sub j is null. How might you infer this invariant uh, automatically is the problem I'm trying to address here. So here's what we do. And I'm going to apologize in advance because I'm a little bit of a newcomer to this sort of analysis and tried to find relevant research. If someone wants to tell me afterwards what I should be reading on this, uh, please do. But oh, all right. So we introduce a symbolic constant for the array length. Uh, the result of the allocation produces both, uh, as before, an abstract reference set for the local variable, but also one further state component. The uninitialized range of R is an initially from 0 to its maximum index. All of those are known to be null. So we'll go further. We keep track of integer values here. So I is known to be 0. We'll do the array the first time. We're about to execute the loop for the first time. We're about to execute the uh, array, array store. What happens here is that if the value of the index expression, i, is equal to, in the analysis, one of the extremes of the uninitialized range of the array you're writing to, and that's a unique singleton set array, you, you know what array you're writing to, then you contract the uninitialized range in the appropriate direction. So here we contracted it and also forgot the other bound. It's now everything greater than 1 up to the end uh, to make things simpler. So after this write, it's only the case that 1 and above is null. And now we increment i. And now we're going to uh, the control flow leads back to the loop head. So we're going to merge these two analysis states and try to uh, the merge operation. What merge operation will we use here? So what we do is when two abstract values differ by a constant, whereas the two values of i, for example, differ by 1. We'll call that the stride. There's another state component, the low bound of the uninitialized range of r, that also differs by a constant. We're going to speculatively assume that all such components that differ by the same stride are functions of the same variable. So we're going to introduce a new uh, variable v to represent those values. You know, it doesn't have to be ident identical. This could be, you know, if that had been 10 and 11, this could be v plus 10. Um, this could be an improper assumption, right? If it was, uh, if it was i times equals 2, uh, you know, it, would, it would break it going from 2 to 4. But in that case, the fixed point, you wouldn't reach a fixed point. You'd, you'd uh, forget, you'd, you'd lose information eventually and get to a, right, a proper less information fixed point. So then we'll go through the process again. Uh, the lower bounds of the of i equals the lower bound of the uninitialized range, so it contracts by 1. And then it gets incremented by 1. And now when we do the fixed point, we recognize that this is just as good a representation of, of, of this one. So you have reached a fixed point. And now you can stop. And it, and it was the case that uh, this store always overwrote null. The, the index was always in the uninitialized range. OK, so results. Uh, so what this shows is above the line is field stores. Below the line is array stores. The background thing always adds up to 100. So it's showing the ratio of dynamically, dynamic field stores to array stores in these applications, uh, benchmark applications. The yellow lines are what fraction of those are executed by store sites that in this run are potentially pre-null. We always observe null. Maybe they're provably pre-null. We don't know. The green are the ones, using the techniques I described, we're actually able to prove pre-null and thus can eliminate the SATB barriers on. Sometimes we do pretty well. MTRT, even Jess, um, maybe even Jack, I'm not. I'm not embarrassed about. Sometimes we don't. You know, that's a fairly small fraction of the, the stores. So, so I'm going to say this is a good start. Uh, and I still have 
We started five minutes late, right? So, okay, I'm so good. Uh, we get also a little bit of code, uh, code size decrease from not generating the code for the SATB barriers. Nothing to write home about either, two to five percent. It's dominated by the uh, field stores here. The array stores, again, are statically a small fraction, though dynamically amplified by occurring in loops. Uh, the t numbers on top are out of, out of a total, you know, total code size. And finally, I'll note that the, you know, how much does this analysis cost? Well, it's uh, sensitive to the amount of the aggressiveness of your inlining. What, uh, how big is the program graph you create in the compiler? So is a trade-off. The more aggressive you are in inlining, the greater your analysis scope, the greater your likelihood of being able to prove things without in an intra-procedural intra analysis. So occasionally we see big jumps going from 35 as the maximum byte code size to inline to 100 gives us uh, 20 to 60 percent of the stores eliminated in MTRT. However, the analysis cost also varies with the inlining level. Java C is the worst case for the analysis cost in these benchmarks. Total compilation time goes up a little bit nonlinearly, but the analysis time goes up more severely nonlinearly. So you'd have to stay down in here with these techniques to, you know, 100 is the default we're using in, in our measurements here. You know, it's maybe n cubed, something like that. Um, okay, uh, I want to briefly suggest some ideas that we haven't implemented but uh, are at least, I hope, plausible for future work here. Here's an interesting example. Um, hash table has an enumerator type, which has a has more elements um, method. And what it does is entry here is a, a field of the enumerator. It reads that into a local variable to cache it, and then at the end it's going to write it back because it might modify it. Turns out, let, let's not look at the semantics of this too much. It's some code someone write, wrote, and this is what it does. Well, I claim there are two cases here. First of all, let's say we read entry and its value is null. Well, then we come down to the E is null too. We come down to the loop. We execute it some number of times, and we get down to entry. And if we assume that the enumerator is thread local, so no other thread is going to modify its fields, then we're overwriting null. This is a pre-null write. On the other hand, let's say that um, we read entry, and it's some value R that's not equal to null. Then, well, it's not, E is not equal to null. We won't enter the loop. We'll come down here, and we'll overwrite R with R. Well, we clearly don't need an SATB barrier for that. So, so we call this pre-null or same. Um, we haven't re, uh, completely decided how to best realize this observation in our framework, but, but it, there's significant potential here. This is 15% of the stores, the pointer stores in Java C, 8% in Jack, and 4% for JVB, because enumerators are used fairly often. Um, and I want to finish with a couple more ex uh, motivating examples. DB has a stupid sorting routine, the in middle inner loop of which does this swap idiom. And collectively, these two stores account for 70% of the pointer stores in DB. Go figure. Um, there's a tantalizing observation here that this swap sequence doesn't change the reachability in the graph. You know, the array still points to the same things before and after. If the swap was atomic with respect to observation of the array elements by the concurrent marker. Um, so keep that in your head. Let's do one more example. In JBB, the most common stores, are 12% collectively, are in two loops of the form, well, let's take uh, the elements of this object array at index, count of them, and move them down by one. Uh, you know, could have been an array copy, but it isn't. It's a loop. Um, so here, only the red element is overwritten. It sure would be nice if we only had to log that, but again, it requires some sort of atomicity with respect to the uh, concurrent marking process. So a couple things you could do here. One is to commit to a particular collector scanning order, say in ascending index order. In that case, it, you could eliminate one of the barriers in the swap idiom, and if the order that the collector scans things in matches the order in which you do the move down or move up idiom, then you get to only log the overwritten element, it turns out. Um, 
or you could try to be optimistic, assume that there's no, that you're not going to be looking at them at the same time. The collector isn't going to be looking at them while you're doing this and detect the failure of this assumption afterwards somehow with some sort of uh, extra protocol that the mutator has to follow. Um, and that would eliminate all the barriers, but you know, might cause extra collector work because of if the optimistic currency control fails. Unfortunately, it turns out that um, I was excited about these ideas, and then I realized that unsynchronized mutator mutator concurrency destroys all of these uh, attempts. So you'd have to somehow figure out how to keep there from being unsynchronized mutator mutator concurrency. Maybe uh, escape analysis to prove the raised thread local or some sort of uh, introduced locking. It's the best I can do at this point. So there's other things to to consider here. Um, related work, uh, Martin Vechev and uh, David Bacon at IBM uh, did a paper on right barrier removal for SATB, but it's more in the flavor of a limit study to uh, get the upper bound on the opportunities, not necessarily uh, an algorithm for obtaining them, as we've shown here. There's a number of, uh, way back when in the 60s, I guess, a guy named Barth uh, did some work on, the original work on compressing reference counting transactions uh, so that you don't have to actually do the updates via compiler analysis if you're doing several pointer modifications to the same object. There's a, a little bit of a literature in eliminating generational write barriers in generational collectors. Uh, Karen Z and Martin Reinhardt at MIT, Yefim Schuff. Um, but that's a completely separate issue other than the fact that it has to do with write barriers. Uh, plenty of pointer and escape and shape analyses. Um, I tried to argue that they're not, certainly they're not used for this purpose, and usually it's not the case that they're quite appropriate for this purpose as well. You have to tweak them somewhat. Uh, and as I said, I'm not really sure what the relevant related work is on the uh, induction variable, uh, on the invariant inference for the kind of invariant inference we showed to justify the array uh, store removal. If anyone wants to point me at anything, please do. There's some induction variable identification literature which has something to do with it, I guess. But In conclusion, I uh, tried to argue in the last talk in this one that snapshot at the beginning concurrent marking is superior except for its right barrier cost. So if you can get that down uh, and we have a good start that eliminates a respectable fraction, then you know, you've made it look better. So a possible objection to this work is Boy, this is a hell of a lot of static analysis for you know the actual payoff you're getting. Isn't this way out of proportion to you know, to what you're for what you're doing? And the answer is yes, of course. Uh, but if you're already doing a sophisticated pointer and escape analysis for other reasons, and there are plenty of other reasons to do that, piggybacking this analysis on that is a, a small extra overhead. And uh, why not? That's why we that's why we get this understanding of what the shape of the the memory graph is. So you so you can do optimizations. All right, um, and I forget about that. Thank you very much. Any questions? Said it all. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I guess they had his last word. Well, listen, how, no, how much of the uh, of the collector, for example, is written in Java itself? None whatsoever. No. Yeah. <laughs> um, it's, it's it's kind of sad, you know. I, I work on garbage collect on Java implementation that's on for nine years, and the, the biggest Java program I wrote was an attempt to uh, to do iTunes in Java. <laughs> <laughs> Anything else? Thank you very much for your time.